Joining me on the line, as he does every Friday on the show, he's from CinemaBlend.com. He is Mr. Controversy83 on social media. Friends, his name is Mike Reyes. Hello, Mike. How are we this week? We're doing well. You know, we're we're at the movies. Did, How about you? Did you see any good movies this week? Ah, <laughs> oh, well, my good friend, I'm glad you asked, because as a movie purveyor of, of movie opinions, <laughs> I have movie thought movies. <laughs> Okay, for everybody at home, we were. He, I asked him what movies we were talking about. He's like, "Would it kill you to open Google?" Or it was something close to that. It was very funny. And now he's just giving me the business. So it's, I find it's a more interesting show when we give each other the business instead of just, yeah. I mean, if if the, if the fountain's on, you gotta you gotta drink. And we we have quite a few movies this week, both streaming <laughs> and mostly in theaters. If the fountain's like on, of, you got to drink. I've never heard that, and it's funny for some reason. Well, you know, if, if, if it's like a fountain you can drink from, I wouldn't go to, like, Bethesda Fountain in uh, New York and start drinking from there. I mean, that's Oh, why not? And uh, <laughs> All right, friends, let's get to the movies. Uh, Mike, what are, we, uh, what are we looking at first here? All right, well, I'm going to start with one of the big ones that's going theatrical because it looks like we're – Things are getting more and more normal, and I put that in quotes because we're still dealing with a pandemic, but things are getting more normal when it comes to going back to the movies. And we're getting to, you know, huge opening weekends and a lot more movies opening theatrically ex- with exclusivity windows. And one of them is The Black Phone, which is Blumhouse's latest horror film adapted from a short story by Joe Hill, a uh, famed fi- fiction writer. And it is from the team that brought us Sinister and Doctor Strange. Okay. It's good. It is. is it? It, uh, you know what? I, I'm, I find myself surprised with as twisted and as horrific as the events in this movie are that I call it cozy. But the reason I call it cozy is because this is like straight up horror that a lot of people like. I mean, Joe Hill, for those of you that don't know, is Stephen King's son, one of Stephen King's sons. And he you know, followed in his father's footsteps and started writing horror. Yeah. And his material feels like it's in that same sort of wheelhouse. Like this is the story of a a young boy named Finn who is abducted by a a serial child abductor known as the grabber. And he is imprisoned in this man's basement. And, and basically he's, you know, the, the, the police are trying to figure out where this guy is. Uh, Finn's sister, Gwen has some psychic ish abilities, kind of like other characters in the Stephen King universe. Okay. And it's basically a, a race against time to either find where this guy is or fight him off. What, I'm and, sorry, what was the name oh, of the yeah, movie again? The Black Phone. Okay. Oh, and there's also that supernatural element of there's a black phone that while it's not connected to an actual phone line, it's connected to the afterlife. What? Dun, dun, dun. Whoa. Yeah, it's good. All no, right. dude, just it's this is solid blockbuster horror and what i really like is blumhouse just kind of has they they have this knack i mean this sinister was one of the movies that helped put blumhouse on the map not the movie but one of those movies and that was where scott derrickson and writer c robert cargill kind of first paired up and you know as a work of as a fan of both of them it's just great to see the team keep moving and it yeah this is just i'm i was surprised it's under two hours because this really does dig into a groove where it's like you don't care how long it is it doesn't feel too short or too long it is just you're hooked it looks creepy i'll give it that it is creepy ethan hawk is fantastic as the grabber and then you've got madison tams i'm sorry mason tams uh please sir if i have mispronounced your name uh let me know Mason Tams as Finney Shaw and Madeline McGraw as his sister Gwen. These are two child performers that give amazing performances where they have to swear at point. And it's like, you know, kids swearing in a movie, it can either be jarring or it can be, you know, oh, really funny, so precocious if you don't do it the right way. These two are so grounded in this that especially with Madeline McGraw, who gets like a lot of profane moments, the way that she delivers those lines is brilliant. And this it really is, you know, children being children, not being too precocious for their own good. It's like really solid acting. And really real quick, anybody can sound bad cursing if they're not good at it. It's not just yeah, a kid's like thing. You, no, absolutely. It's like if you're swearing is such an art <laughs> because it is. <laughs> adults, can mis- adults can misuse it. And it's just like, oh, you swear so much. 
and it, it, it makes no sense. But, you know, it, it, there's an art to delivering the word, to knowing when to deliver the word. It's just yeah. like when we use our, our, our bleep card here. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm not going to just, unless it's something really fun or it's a good opportunity, I'm not just going to start the show off with it. Unless you're South yeah, Park the movie. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's just like the one song in the beginning, and then from straight from that point on, it's like the moment they go to Terrence and Philip, the movie, the rest of the movie just broke records. Oh, it's so great! But, but yeah, Black Phone is really good. Uh, it's no wonder to see why Universal actually pushed this to June because originally this was going to open in February, and you know February is a good month for horror. I mean, early early year early horror movie uh, bleh, words. Early releases for horror movies tend to be good because it's like outside of yeah yeah blockbuster yeah. Temper, bl- typical blockbuster season. But Universal, man, we are at a point right now where Top Gun Maverick's going back to IMAX this weekend because Paramount really wants to break that billion barrier. Uh, Lightyear is still trying to perform. Jurassic World is still in theaters, and that's a Universal release. Like we're still at a point right now where there are movies still performing pretty well and still yet to come. But this horror movie was so good that the studio's like, you know what, we're going to roll the dice and put this against the big movies. And for that reason, on top of how good this movie is, I highly recommend people go see The Black Phone because horror like this belongs in theaters. I like it. Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com joining me on the line to talk about movies. Uh, that's The Black Phone. Uh, you want to do Beavis and Butthead? Yeah, because I haven't seen it yet, and, and I, I know you, b Sox, on KGGO, have actually seen this film. I have uh, seen oh, it. And all I'm going to say, folks, is it's currently on Paramount Plus streaming. I'm going to let b Sox take it away to tell us what he thought, because I need to know, because it looks good. Uh, so there I was, just me in the recliner last night. I was going to watch Strange New Worlds. So I turned on Paramount, and I'm like, Beavis and Butthead is out. I forgot about this. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's, I'm surprised how how there hasn't been a bigger like push for this, but it's it's good. Oh, it's great! It's everything Beavis and Butthead is supposed to be. Like if you like uh, Beavis and Butthead Do America, you're gonna like this. Oh, that's <laughs> what I want to hear. I it, loved that movie. Like there are genuinely funny parts in it that are. I, I mean, if you don't like Beavis and Butthead, you're not gonna get anything out of it. If you grew up and liked Beavis and Butthead, you're gonna love it. Like Patrick Stewart is going to love this damn movie. <laughs> Yeah, I forgot he was a Beavis and Butthead fan. Oh, yeah, he's a huge fan. But uh, (laughs) no, uh, it's uh, basically uh, they're trying to score, which, you know. (laughs) (laughs) You know, know, how many many people have done the impersonation when they're talking about this movie? It's like everybody (laughs) this week, right? It's just there is something about Mike Judge where he takes a concept like Beavis and Butthead or King in the Hill or Office Space and it's not very showy in the yeah. sense that like you can make it for like a, a, a you can make it for a modest budget but the humor that he finds in something as simple as like Beavis and Butthead just watching music videos or Office Space basically the whole movie being summed up in the two words work sucks <laughs> like he finds so he and his teams find such brilliant material in those sorts of things. And like King of the Hills, one I've especially been growing to uh, appreciate getting older. Cause you know, as a kid of the era, it's like Ugh, King of the Hill wins the Simpsons on. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. now it's like, wow, King of the Hill aged much better than the Simpsons. Oh and yeah. And it was really because of just hometown sort of people humor and not just, okay, we've got a, uh, we've got, a celebrity guest on this week. Let's uh, pack the jokes. It's you know what it is. It's a level of eccentric <clears throat> in some of these characters that you kind of know oh, where the yeah. ceiling is on. You know, like a Hank Hill. You kind of know where the ceiling is on Dale or Beavis and Butthead and stuff. So you can cut if you stay within that. Your character, you know, for the entire run, your character is usually pretty good. It's when they go completely all over the place that you kind of lose it. You know, like a a Family Guy or a Simpsons or you know. Uh, uh, Rick and Morty is kind of built in that world where it's supposed to be like that. I will say this, Beavis and Butthead towards the end goes very, very Rick and Morty. The movie or the, the, the show? The movie. The movie. Oh. Yeah, all of a sudden, I, I got a lot of Rick and Morty vibes at the very end. But no, uh, going back to the movie itself, I mean, it, it's all the Beavis and Butthead humor. Um, there's some time traveling. There's some sci-fi stuff. Uh, there's them kicking each other in the nuts. The <laughs> 
I will, I will tell you one thing. There was a scene that I was kind of surprised they put in it. It's uh, so they. <laughs> I don't want to don't spoil it, but say why you're they, surprised. They go into a a, uh, a gender studies class in the year 2022. So imagine dropping Beavis and Butthead humor oh, into no. a a class like that, and um, <laughs> I I don't think I'm trying to figure out the right way to say it because I don't want to spoil too much. But I don't they that that actually sounds like it's it's pretty. Oh, go on. They. Uh, uh, it, it moves into the world of white privilege, and Beavis and Butthead take what? the idea of white privilege in a very, very interesting direction. And oh, I don't. I need to see this. It was one of those things. I'm like, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh at it, but it is funny. <laughs> Ooh, but it was. It, I can't. I, yeah, it was one of those kind of jokes that you know, kind of the day and age we're in. You don't see it a lot, you know. So yeah. it, it was an interesting, like, wow, they actually went there, and it was. It was funny, and they did it in a way that that made fun of it and put a Beavis and Butthead spin on it. I, I don't think I'm describing it great. It's just one of those seeds you have to see. Well, everybody can't see it now because Beavis and Butthead Do the Universe is currently on Paramount Plus streaming exclusive. Real quick, one, one other thing. There, there is a, a repetitive joke they do at the very beginning. And I started laughing at it, and I could not stop. It's a sound that Beavis <laughs> makes when something is happening, and it goes over and over and over again. And it's so damn funny. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Anyways. So, yeah. Beavis and Butthead do the universe, currently streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, I feel like I already said that, but, you know, time travel may have been involved. Uh, yes, very humorous. KGGO, speaking movies with me. Very humorous. Very droll. <laughs> The the future Beavises and Buttheads are f***ing funny. Uh, Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com joining me on the line. Uh, what's next movie-wise? B-Socks, are, are you a Beatles man or an Elvis man? Uh, it's one of those weird ones where we, we've talked about this in the building before. Like, I get the Beatles, like, why they're big. Am I a giant fan of them? No. I, I, I can't say I've ever gone, hey, I can't wait to put on that Beatles album. When I get in the car tonight, you know? Yeah. I've always genuinely hated that question because I don't think you have to be one or the other. And like, and, I know it's like a sacred Quentin Tarantino thing from Pulp Fiction, but I just, I don't think, I don't think you need to choose. Well, I think it's one of those things when you work in radio, like we don't play Elvis. We play a little bit of Beatles just because Elvis was a little bit. And listen, I Elvis is kind of in the same realm for me. Like I under, I understand he was an icon. I understand. It's like knowing about Hulk Hogan without being a fan of Hulk Hogan and understanding his role in the in the business and the entertainment and just in the world in general. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reason I ask is because this weekend we have Boz Lerman's Elvis biopic which uh, stars Austin Butler as the king himself, and Tom Hanks as Colonel Tom Parker, the uh, supposedly cartoonish villain in this movie that I haven't seen it, but there was a tweet uh, that I saw, and it basically said that Elvis was the speed racer of music biopics, and I feel like I need to see it now well, you said because it was, of the fact that... You said it was well, done by the guy from Moulin Rouge, right? Yes, Boz Lerman has given us such fever dreams as uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, with Leonardo DiCaprio and Claire Danes, uh, Moulin Rouge, Australia. He did The Great Gatsby a couple years ago, and I'm basically hearing he takes those bug nuts talents and applies them to a musical biopic about Elvis Presley and his childhood, his rise to fame. And not to mention, I thought I heard that there is a scene, probably towards the end, where El I don't know if it's Elvis performing them or maybe it's just a montage of other versions, but I thought I heard like future pop songs are thrown into like a montage like Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, like modern pop or like interesting uh, stuff like more modern pop. All right, but yeah, it looks uh, it looks wild, and I need to get my eyes around it. Uh, we'll talk more about Elvis once we've seen it because I'm kind of interested to see how this is, especially when you put that moon. Yeah, that Moulin Rouge oh, yeah. feel in there. So, uh, oh, yeah. how many how many more movies do we have? Uh, we have one more that's going to theaters, and okay. I mention it because while I haven't seen it, I'm really excited to actually go. It's uh, Marcel Marcel the Shell with shoes on. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but it's this uh -huh. uh, cartoon, well, uh, stop motion animation, I think, short that Jenny Slate <laughs> oh, would be doing. 
she voices this this shell called Marcel, and it's just like this cute little sort of innocent, like the, it, as the internet would say, Marcel is baby. Okay. It's like a cute little shell that just has kind of this optimistic outlook on life, and they expanded into a feature film where Marcel's trying to find other members of his family besides his grandmother, played by Isabel Rossellini. And it's just a road trip movie with this cute little shell that looks absolutely funny, but also I think it's going to make me cry a lot. And it looks just gorgeous. All right. Like very open hearted. Like if you liked Brian and Charles last week, this look sounds like it's going to be around the same sort of area. All righty. Uh, Mike Rice from CinemaBlend.com joining me on the line. All right, let's switch gears over to the world of movie news. Um, what do we want to start with this week? Well, Thor Love and Thunder is actually premiered in Hollywood last night at a gigantic event that Marvel, you know, it's, it's basically your big Marvel premiere. Uh, everybody is flown out and assembled and they get to go see the movie, talk to people on the red carpet, and then the tweets come like, This is basically, if you want to know the first reactions of any Marvel movie, it happens the night of the premiere. Like, that's the big embargo lift. What are people saying about it? A lot of people are saying it is basically what you would expect from a Taika Waititi Thor movie. Uh, Very colorful, big adventure, lots of jokes, uh, apparently a lot of Guns N' Roses involved. I guess a sweet child of mine in the trailer would have been the big uh, indicator of that. Yeah. And people are giving some love, obviously, for Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie, Natalie Portman's new Thor, and apparently Christian Bale is really good as the villain. No surprise there. I was wondering how that was going to go. I always go back to that thing uh, where he lost his S on uh, the set of, uh, it was Terminator, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Terminator Salvation. And I, I always, I don't look at him as a guy that he goes to work and he has a lot of fun. Like, it's work. When you're with him. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just he's a guy that takes it really serious. He does. But I think he I think when you give him the right thing, he has fun because I'm sorry, watching him in Ford v. Ferrari, that man was having fun. That man was just loving life. And it was like maybe it was because the character allowed him to do it. But he was just so happy, like the smile on his face looks so legit. And that is just a movie that I, I love going back to. And, but obviously, you know, with Gore the God Killer, this sounds like another one where he'd be like, very, okay, I'm intense. I'm doing this. This is, <laughs> this is my lane, and I'm staying in this lane. I, so we'll find out more because the big, uh, the all media critic screenings are happening next week. And then, you know, we're not that far from the public getting their hands on this one. Huh, interesting. I, I do think it's interesting. What does Thor want more, Mjolnir or Jane Foster back? That is a very good question. I don't know it feels like they're one and the same because they're relics of his past life where he was more carefree and you know Thanos hadn't killed half of the universe oh that's fucking deep <laughs> yeah and i bet the movie doesn't get even that close i mean I, I'm no sure it's no be fun. i'm sure it's gonna be fun and it's gonna have you know it's it's moments but yeah it's a taiko Watiti movie and those are usually mixed in with the the humor yeah and i what do you think of Thor ragnarok I liked it. I, I was okay with it, but I'm still just not big on the Thor movies. I the first Thor was what it needed to be to set up the character. Uh, the second one was it was kind of like Iron Man two. It felt like it was more just doing something to push the story along than to be a masterpiece. Um, oh well, I disagree with that because I actually liked uh, Iron I, Man two. I, I I know I like I liked Iron Man two as well, but it, it was one of those movies where. There were just things in it that had to be in there because they needed to put them in there somewhere. They had to get the ether involved in the Marvel Universe in some form, and this is how we're going to do it. So we're going to do Dark well, Elves. Now you're jumping into Thor, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, but uh, like the arc reactor and the uh, shield stuff and all of that, I felt like it was more to set up that in Iron Man 2. Than, oh. And it was, you know... Uh, uh, Thor 2 was, we need to get more mythology out there about the Infinity Stones. All right, let's wrap it in a, a Dark Elves movie. Yeah. I mean, they're, again, good ideas, but bad execution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it uh, again, I don't hate Iron Man 2. Uh, I don't hate Thor 2. I I think Thor 2 still has one of the best jokes ever done in the Marvel Universe. Is it the Loki transformation sequence? No. It's where he hangs up the hammer. Hmm. 
don't remember that one. When, he, when they're going into Jane's apartment after getting back from wherever, and he takes his hammer and he hangs it up on the coat hanger. And it was like an improv joke that they let left in there, and I always thought it was so damn funny. And it was such a simple joke. So, anyway, yeah. I, I guess it. Uh, I guess me and you are very different when we watch Marvel movies. <laughs> but um, no, Thor three. I thought I thought they did stuff in Thor three that they had to do. They had to make the character more interesting. They had to give him more of that humor side. Uh, you had too many serious characters. You needed someone that was kind of the bumble of the group and thor for whatever reason fits it more into that slot that he does the you know super serious captain america type thing you know so i don't know that's my thought i'm looking forward to it uh it should be interesting mike reyes from cinemablend.com joining me on the line uh what do we got next because i do want to talk about obi-wan wrapped up this week have you seen it no i'm still uh, it's not that i don't that it's been (laughs) oh well it's Excuse me for being busy and going to see movies I so I can interview people and, and write about them. I know. for f***ing vid, man. I could, I could hear the type or uh, the keyboard in the background, so I know you're putting your full attention on this. So No, I am putting my full attention on it. It's just, well, historic um, news is dropping right now and not in the good way. So what's going on? I are kind of venting. Uh, Supreme Court uh, just overturned Roe v. Wade. Oh, holy yes. Yeah, uh, the threat has officially been fulfilled. Well, the, the, wow. All right, then. And we're just going to cut this on the show because we don't need to talk about this on air because I have thoughts that would not be airable. All right, Mike Grace from CinemaBlend.com joining me on the line. Uh, we're going to jump back to uh, Obi-Wan. We're going to just jump back to that. Okay. All right. uh, the I'm last get- five minutes didn't happen. It's a firestorm, no matter what side you sit on. Yeah. All right, so... That won't make it into a Thor movie, will it? No, it will not. Mike Reyes from CinemaBlend.com. All right, we'll sidetrack back into the world of entertainment. Um, Obi-Wan uh, wrapped up this week. You have not seen... How many How many are you behind? Uh, basically anything from episode four on. Okay. And it's not because I don't want to. It's because, again, just... Yeah, I get it. Seeing movies, and I I really do need to catch up, though, because what I have seen, I love, and I keep hearing very mixed reactions to what has happened in these last couple episodes. I frankly think it's the best Star Wars to come out in probably 10 years. That sounds about accurate. I mean, it, and I'm not saying that like just because of the competition up it's up against. It's really good. Like it's a well done story. It's filling in some of the gaps. It's um, I know some people are like, oh well, you know, canon says it. well, it, it's establishing canon. And like yeah, when you so- canon was pretty loose to begin with. When you start looking at some of the stuff in there, uh, it it starts filling in some of those gaps and why Obi Wan would say, well, uh, he was killed by you know Darth Vader and all this and it, like you're filling in some of that and it's just it's really good. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good if you do it the right way. And if you don't do it the right way, it seems very pandery and and just cute. Oh, yeah, so far Obi-Wan has been doing it well. And just based on the first three episodes, and I know it'll continue, I like the fact that they give him this early adventure with Leia because it basically fills in the gap of, okay, why did she send him that hologram to begin with? I mean, you could you could have just left it as you served with my father during the Clone Wars, blah blah blah. But then it's that added context of no, he served with. She's talking about Bail Organa. I don't think yeah. she's talking about Anakin. Yeah. And it's just she trusts him that deeply with the fate of the universe because he saved her when she was young and and in grave danger from one of the members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. All of this finally explains why she named her kid Ben Solo. And I love that. And I would love to see them continue to fill out Leia's character because I, I'm one of the things that really upset me with Carrie Fisher's passing was that her character was finally getting hitting a stride and getting the attention and the the lore that she deserved. Like she became a general. Like I, unless I'm talking about era specific stuff, I will for, from now on call her General Leia or General Organa yeah. because Princess Leia is in the past like she did something like she was a senator she became a tactician like this is stuff that was really cool and another thing that's great about this era of star wars is representation is becoming something so big but also it's not 
it, I feel like they do it better when they're with things like Young Leia's story. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 really good, man. I'm just gonna uh, we'll leave it there because I don't want to spoil too much for you, and I want you to enjoy it. But there, there, uh, some of the things they do with Darth Vader towards the end are frightening. Oh, I want to. That's what I want to hear. Like also, it is. Also, Ewan McGregor just being an all-timer. He's probably one of the best Star Wars characters. Like everybody can say what yeah. they want about the prequels and stuff, but this this cements him as wow. And it makes the prequels, like, I want to go back and watch the prequels now again and see if I see them in a different light. Obi-Wan was always one of the best things about the prequels. Uh, Ewan McGregor was one of the things that made episode two not as completely terrible as it could have been. And I also have been hearing good things about Hayden Christensen coming back as Vader. Yeah. And I don't blame him, I, I don't blame him for what happened. And, you know, it's, you know what, it, it was what it was. It, the, the love story didn't work, but just the savagery that Star Wars fans sometimes engage in. And, yeah. You know, you hear the stories about Ahmed Best, like basically thinking about suicide because of how people yeah. bagged on him for Jar Jar Binks. And then Jake Lloyd's sort of tragic story about sliding in a horrible life after like all that criticism as a kid. The like this, it, they're movies, man. I know the the interesting part about this, and it's probably a question that's been asked a lot. Like if you took the prequels and put them in the hands of not someone that understood the Star Wars universe the way, you know, the creator of it, but a, a, a director. Like I know George Lucas yeah. has directed some stuff, but is he the best director there's ever been? I, I don't think anybody's going to make that argument. Depends on what movie you're talking about, because THX 1138 and American Graffiti are still all-timers. Okay. And even, even A New Hope. But... I do agree with you. Someone should, have, uh, someone else should have directed the prequel. Like he, he, someone else should have even taken a pass at his writing because that was that was what was so great about the original trilogy was yeah there were different writers and different directors in there. It was still George Lucas's vision. Yeah. But other people contributed and helped shape it in a different way. Yeah. I mean, you how many stories are there out there about how Star Wars? A New Hope would have been lost if it wasn't for his wife at the time basically helping them find it in the edit. Like that is the that is the one line that keeps getting repeated. It's like Star Wars was found in the edit. Yeah. And when you take that control, when you take that accountability away and just leave it in George Lucas's hands, and you know, like he puts his arms around the figure saying it's my, they're my toys, damn it. It worked better than at, at, in some points, but in other points it was just. Like, Revenge of the Sith was great and is arguably the best one, but the real low points were real low with those. Two. Yeah. My buddy goes, it's hard to make space politics interesting when he's talking about the Phantom Menace. But at the same time, none of those movies are worse than Rise of Skywalker. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Yeah, I will watch Attack of the Clones five times before watching Rise <laughs> of Skywalker again once. And if I have to watch Rise of Skywalker again once, I want my wife there to reenact her infamous moment, because just in case anyone forgot, uh, when I first took my wife to see Rise of Skywalker, they make the big reveal that Ray's a descendant from a Palpatine clone. My wife turns over to me and says, she's a f***ing Palpatine. <laughs> and it, like, it, it wasn't loud, but it was loud enough that like you could hear it. And then meanwhile, just the inner me is like sitting there like Palpatine thinking, good, <laughs> yes. use your anger, wife. Strike this film down. I, uh... Do it. I made a bunch of uh, Star Trek nerd, or excuse me, Star Wars nerds, uh, turn around and shush me and look at me. Uh, we went and saw uh, Attack of the Clones, and you know when Yoda pulls out his fighting style? Yeah. I leaned over to my buddy. I go, "Nimble little gainy." I want to pay. I want to pay to been there for that. And all these people turned around and looked at me real mad. <laughs> Oh man, I love that. Oh god. All right. I'll, next time I'll tell Did you. Did we about, end there? Yeah. Next time you tell me what. No. Next time I'll tell you the story of how I made a popcorn helmet during Lord of the Rings. But that's a story for another time, ladies and gentlemen. Mike Graves <laughs> from CinemaBlend.com joining me on the line. Mike, you have a fantastic weekend. Okay. You too, you nimble little. F <laughs>